Welcome back to Red Recapped. Today, I'm gonna break down a 2018 Western drama movie titled The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, brace yourselves for some spoilers. Watch out and take care. It's a sunny day in the Wild West, and there's this fella named Buster Scruggs. He's riding through some empty lands. He looks all cheerful, like a singing cowboy, but here's the twist, he's actually the most dangerous gun wielder around, and there's a big reward for nabbing him. As he's wandering, he stumbles upon a cantina, wanting a drink. But the bartender won't serve him any whiskey, cause it's off limits, only for outlaws. Buster tries to explain he's an outlaw too, not to judge by his clean appearance and happy vibe. But no one buys it, and a cowboy even steps up to start a fight and boot him out. Bad move, cause Buster's lightning fast. He pulls out his gun in a flash and shoots everyone in the cantina. Then he keeps on his way until he reaches Frenchman's Gulch, a town he's never been to. First stop, the local saloon, where he's gotta leave his weapons outside, cause no firearms allowed. Then, he joins a poker game, but only if he takes over for the last player. So, Buster checks the cards and finds out the last player bailed because he had a notorious losing hand. He refuses to play it, which ticks off the others, especially the intimidating Joe. Now, thinking he's above the rules, Joe whips out his hidden gun to threaten Buster. But Buster is quick on his feet. He kicks a loose plank on the table, hitting the gun and turning it on Joe, killing him on the spot. Well, that really chills the saloon. But Buster, not missing a beat, starts singing a song about Joe, just making it up as he goes. Everyone joins in the fun, singing and dancing. But then, in walks Joe's brother, having heard what went down. He calls Buster out for a duel, thirsty for revenge. Once again, Buster shows he's the fastest shooter around. He expertly shoots each of the man's fingers, then, just for a bit of a show, he looks at him in the mirror and finishes the job. Buster's feeling pretty cocky, like his usual self, when suddenly, another singing cowboy shows up in town, the kid. He also challenges Buster to a duel. This time, it's lightning fast. But here's the twist, Buster's the one who ends up in the ground, cause he's finally met someone quicker than him. As Buster's spirit leaves this world, he realizes he should have seen it coming. You can't stay on top forever. He even joins in singing along with the kid's song. Now, in New Mexico, there's this young cowboy who finds a quiet bank to try and rob. The bank teller acts like he's cooperating, but he's actually getting ready to use hidden weapons as a trick before making a quick getaway. The cowboy dodges the shots, grabs the money, but when he tries to leave, the teller starts shooting at him. The cowboy ducks behind a well, tries to shoot back, but it's no use. The teller's got pots and pans protecting him, bouncing off all the bullets. With this extra shield, the teller gets close enough to knock the cowboy out. When the cowboy comes to later, he's tied to a tree, hands bound to his horse's saddle. Turns out, a group has already judged him and sentenced him to death. So, this is his chance to say his last words. But before he can, they get ambushed by a bunch of Comanche warriors. They wipe out the whole group, but leave the cowboy on his horse, figuring it'd be amusing to let him suffer slowly. The cowboy spends a while on his horse, trying hard to keep it still and save himself. Finally, he's lucky and a drover comes along, shoots the rope, and sets him free. They ride together for safety. But, turns out, his luck runs out fast. The drover's actually a cattle thief. When another group comes after them, he ditches the cowboy, leaving him caught again. They bring him to town, he's declared guilty by the judge, and sentenced to hang. While he waits for the end, he focuses on a young woman in the crowd, so the last thing he sees before he goes is something beautiful. Not too far away, there's this old showman traveling with a young man named Harrison. Harrison's got no arms or legs, but he's got a stunning voice. He recites classics from Shakespeare and Lincoln, and every time they stop in a town, their wagon becomes a stage. While Harrison performs, the showman collects money from the audience. The impresario has to take care of everything for Harrison. He feeds him, does his makeup, and even helps him with personal things. It's a tough and sad life, and the impresario gets more and more worn out by it. When they visit rowdy places, the impresario doesn't even bother to get a companion for Harrison. He just leaves him in the same room and turns him around while he takes care of his own business. So, Harrison hears everything. As they travel to more isolated mountain towns, fewer people are interested in their little show, and they hardly make any money. One evening, the impresario notices that their audience is tiny because there's another wagon with a chicken that's amazing everyone. It can do basic math by pecking at painted numbers. Seeing a chance, the impresario decides to buy the chicken and takes care of it just like he does with Harrison, who's starting to worry about what's going to happen next. 
The next day, the impresario stops by a bridge and checks how deep the river is by dropping a big stone into the water. So, the impresario gets the results he wants. Soon after, he's back on the road, but now the only passenger in his wagon is the chicken. Poor Harrison has been pushed into the river. Now, let's talk about a river on a mountain. There's this rugged prospector searching for gold. At first, he only finds tiny specks, but by keeping count, he figures out where to dig. He sets up camp by the river, surviving by fishing and nabbing eggs from nests. After days of small digs, he pinpoints the source and starts digging deeper. His calculations are spot on, and he strikes a big vein of gold that's gonna make him rich. But no time to celebrate, because a young man trailing the prospector gets closer and shoots him. After rolling a smoke to mark the occasion, the young man jumps into the hole to move the body, only to be ambushed by the prospector, who was just playing possum. The old man wrestles the guy for his gun and ends up killing him. He checks the body, confirming it was a clean shot, it went right through his back, missing any vital organs. After tending to the wound, he goes on to mine the gold, buries the young man in the hole, and rides out of the valley on a horse, carrying his newfound fortune. Meanwhile, siblings Alice and Gilbert have joined a wagon train heading across the Oregon Trail. Gilbert isn't much of a businessman, but he claims he's got a new partner who's willing to marry his sister once they reach Oregon. Along with them is Gilbert's dog, President Pierce, who's quite a nuisance to the other travelers due to his constant barking. Shortly after they set off, Gilbert has a severe coughing fit and succumbs, likely to cholera. The leaders of the wagon train, Billy and Arthur, assist Alice in burying him, and they ask if she intends to continue with them or return home. Alice realizes she doesn't have much to go back to, so she decides to stick with the wagon train and try her luck in Oregon. The next day, she gets more bad news, the boy Gilbert hired to lead their wagon says he was promised a whopping $400 and expects half of it when they reach the halfway point. Alice doesn't have that kind of money, and even if her brother did, it's buried with him. Alice talks to Arthur and Billy for advice. They point out that the wage is way too high, definitely more than usual. Alice blames Gilbert for being a lousy businessman, but Billy suspects the boy might be lying. He suggests ignoring him for now and when they reach the halfway point, he'll try to scare the truth out of him. Since folks keep complaining about President Pierce, and Alice doesn't want to be responsible for a dog that's not even hers, Billy helps her out. He takes the dog to the middle of the valley and fires a shot into the air to shoo him off. So, the journey goes on smoothly, and Alice and Billy have some quality time together. They find they agree on a lot of things. When the hired boy asks for his pay, Billy tries to talk to him but doesn't get through. So, he offers Alice an alternative. See, he's been thinking of retiring from the wagon train, and he proposes to Alice. This way, he can take on Gilbert's debt and they can build a home together with a proper family. It's a bit of a shock for Alice, but she's come to care for Billy, so she says yes. A few days later, Arthur notices fresh tracks and realizes Alice is missing. Turns out, she heard President Pierce nearby and went to watch him bark at some prairie dogs. She ended up farther from the wagon train than she thought. Arthur finds her and tries to get back as fast as possible, but sadly, they're not quick enough they get ambushed by a Native American party. Armed with two weapons, Arthur defends himself and gives one to Alice, urging her to use it if he doesn't make it. He believes death is better than being captured by the natives, who would subject her to terrible punishments. Arthur is a skilled gunman and manages to drive the natives away with precise shots. Just when he thinks it's over, a warrior catches him off guard and he falls. Pretending to be unconscious, Arthur waits for the Native American to approach and shoots him. When he returns to Alice, he's hit with the worst news, she also thought he was gone and used the pistol just as he instructed. He covers her with his coat, then starts making his way back to the wagon train with President Pierce, wondering what he'll tell Billy. On a different path, five people are traveling in a stagecoach to Fort Morgan. Thigpen, who's been singing for most of the journey, much to everyone's annoyance, explains that he and his partner Clarence often use this route while transporting cargo. He hints at something they have on top of the coach but doesn't specify what it is. Finally, Thigpen wraps up his singing, and the travelers start chatting. The fur trapper shares a story about his past relationship with a hunk papa woman. They couldn't understand each other's words, but he believes we're all similar in our basic needs. Lady Betjeman, a strong Christian, takes offense to this idea. She firmly states there are only two kinds of people, the virtuous and the sinful. This sparks a heated debate about human nature. Frenchman René chimes in too, but Thigpen and Clarence mostly just make occasional remarks, finding the whole thing quite entertaining. When René questions if Lady Betjeman remained faithful to her husband while living separately for a few years, she gets so upset she's practically speechless. 
Renee tries to get the driver to stop the coach by sticking his head out the window, but it's no use. Thigpen explains that company policy doesn't allow the coach to stop for any reason. To calm Lady Betjeman, Clarence decides to sing a bittersweet folk song. It soothes the woman, but interestingly, it also brings tears to Thigpen's eyes. Intrigued by these mysterious men, the trapper asks them to explain what exactly their line of work is. Thigpen spills the beans, they're bounty hunters. Their operation is flawless, Thigpen entertains their target with stories while Clarence quickly takes them down. Thigpen even admits he enjoys watching them meet their end because there's a kind of beauty in their expressions. Hearing this understandably unsettles the other three passengers, who are now fearful of what might await them at their destination. When the coach finally arrives at Fort Morgan, Thigpen and Clarence retrieve their cargo, which turns out to be a body, and take it into the hotel where everyone is staying. Renee, Lady Betjeman, and the trapper take a bit longer to get off, feeling cautious and uneasy. Eventually, they enter the hotel too. Renee closes the door behind them after watching the coach leave, realizing there won't be an easy way out if they need it. That's all from the video. Thanks for watching and take care.